Missouri sits in the middle. For the last 40 years, it's been the average center of the country's population. And today, more than any other, it can claim to be the state where the north meets the south and the east meets the west. To its east are Illinois and the other heavily urbanized, historically industrial giants surrounding the Great Lakes. To its west, the Great Plains rise in Kansas. As elevation increases, rainfall becomes more sparse, and population begins to taper off. The forests of Arkansas and the cotton fields of the Mississippi Delta lie to its south. To its north, the cornfields of Iowa. A border state that remained with the Union during the Civil War, it's thoroughly Midwestern with a blend of Southern influence. Long the meeting point of the country's urban core and sparsely populated frontier, historically one of the most populous states in the country, it was from Missouri that three of the four great trails of westward expansion began. Roughly halfway between the Rockies and the Appalachians, the Canadian border and the Gulf of Mexico, it's home to flat expanses of farmland and the forested mountains, hills, and cliffs of the Ozarks. The country's two longest rivers meet within its borders, lined by historic river towns and two major American cities, each of which have played an important role in the history of both the state and the country. Missouri is a unique and fascinating place, and the 25th place I'll cover in the U.S. Explained, a 56-part series on every state, territory, and federal district in the country by order of admission. Hello and welcome to That is Interesting. I'm your host, Carter. This is the U.S. Explained. Episode 25, Missouri. According to the Keppen climate classification, Missouri sits within two climate zones. The very northern quarter of the state sits in the hot summer humid continental zone with four distinct seasons, hot summers, and cold winters, while the rest is warmer, sitting in the humid subtropical climate zone with hot summers, mild winters, and high humidity. It has roughly average humidity levels in days of sunlight as well as precipitation and temperatures. It's 26 out of the 50 states by rain and snowfall, getting an average 42.5 inches of precipitation annually, and it's pretty consistent across regions, though the south gets a little more than the north. With an average temperature of 54.7 degrees Fahrenheit, it's the 19th warmest state in the country, roughly in the middle of the pack as well. It gets tornadoes, but not as many as its neighbors in the Great Plains, and deals with flooding as well. Perhaps the most surprising natural disaster the state deals with are earthquakes. Despite being far from the edge of the North American plate, Missouri is home to the New Madrid Seismic Zone, a system of fault lines near the town of New Madrid, which sits on the Mississippi River in the south of the state. Though geologists don't fully agree on the cause of the seismic zone, it's thought to be the result of an ancient underground rift, an area where the North American plate began to split in two but failed, and it was responsible for the largest earthquake ever recorded in the country east of the Rockies, which destroyed entire towns and caused the Mississippi River to flow backwards for a few hours. The entire state is located in the central time zone. Its nickname is a fairly unusual one, the Show Me State. There are two theories behind where the nickname came from. One is that it was an insult towards Missourians who had been brought in to break a mining strike in Colorado and not knowing local mining techniques had to be shown how. The other, more popular theory is that it came from a speech by Congressman Willard Van Diver, who said, Frothy eloquence neither convinces nor satisfies me. I am from Missouri. You have got to show me. Regardless of how it originated, this meaning, portraying Missourians as independent and not gullible, is what has stuck. The state is named for the Missouri River, the longest river in the United States, which begins in the Rockies of Montana and flows through six states before entering Missouri, where it flows into the Mississippi just outside of St. Louis. Longer than the entire Mississippi by just one mile, together they make up the fourth longest river system on the planet stretching 3,902 miles or 6,275 kilometers from the mountains of Montana to the Gulf of Mexico. Though the Missouri is longer, it drains a large but much more arid part of the country than the Mississippi, and as such contributes significantly less water when the two meet near St. Louis. 
Because of this, it's not considered the main stem of the river. Then again, further downstream, the Ohio brings in significantly more water than the Mississippi when the two meet, so it isn't quite consistent. Regardless, the Missouri is one of the country's most important waterways and is very influential within the state. Three of Missouri's four largest urban areas, as well as its state capital, all sit within a few miles of the river. The river itself takes its name from the Niuwachi people, who lived along it near what is now the town of Brunswick. The Illinois, members of a confederation of native peoples who lived further east, referred to the Niuwachi as the ones with dugout canoes. In their language, the Wimisorita. The French pronounced it as Missouria, which later American settlers then called Missouri. Missouri's flag shows red, white, and blue stripes, representing the American flag, with a blue and white ring of 24 stars in the middle, as it was the 24th state to join the Union, encircling the state seal, which prominently features two bears around a series of other symbols, the U.S. coat of arms, representing the United States, a crescent, representing the Louisiana Territory, and a bear, representing Missouri itself. Personally, I think a lot of state seal flags can be pretty cluttered and difficult to differentiate, but I think Missouri stands out and is a pretty nice looking flag. The state license plate is heavily inspired by it. Taking up 68,742 square miles or 178,041 square kilometers, Missouri is on the larger side of the middle of the pack in terms of land area at 18th out of the 50 states. It's slightly smaller than North Dakota, but larger than Oklahoma, roughly similar in size to countries like Cambodia and Uruguay. Though historically one of the most populous states in the country, throughout the last century, Missouri has been surpassed by a number of faster growing states, and today is roughly in the upper middle of the pack in terms of population as well, again at 18th out of the 50 states. With 6.19 million residents, it's home to more people than Maryland, but fewer than Indiana, a similar population to Paraguay or the Republic of the Congo. In terms of population density, it's in the middle as well. Its density of 89.5 people per square mile, or 34.6 per square kilometer, places it at 28th out of the 50 states. Other than Alabama, which is slightly closer, Missouri has one of the closest population densities to that of the United States overall, a difference of just over 5 people per square mile. Considering Missouri is a mix of large and small cities, small towns, rural agricultural regions, and wilderness, it makes sense that it would be so representative of the country's population distribution. In fact, the mean population center of the U.S., the point at which the average distance to each person in the country is the shortest, has been located in Missouri since 1980, moving southwest across the state as the country's population has continued to move westward and shift south to the Sun Belt throughout the 1900s. Today, it's located near the southern Missouri town of Hartville. Missouri sits in the center of the country, in the southern end of the region known as the Midwest. Though mostly Midwestern, it has southern influences as well, and is sometimes grouped in as part of the south. Parts of Missouri, especially the far southeastern region known as the Boot Heel, are undoubtedly southern, but further to the north it begins to feel much more like the Midwest. This, along with the presence of the Ozarks, a distinct region on their own that's often described as culturally similar to Appalachia, and the Rust Belt influences of St. Louis, makes Missouri a unique regional meeting point. I sometimes bring up a Vox survey that asks readers what states they consider to be part of the South, which can give an interesting perspective into perceptions of what makes a region. 20% of respondents said Missouri was part of the South. They did another survey asking about what makes up the Midwest, and Interestingly, it was the exact inverse, with 80% saying Missouri was Midwestern. In terms of the U.S. explained, Missouri is the first state I'm covering that, aside from a few small oxbow lakes, sits fully west of the Mississippi River, the country's classic east-west dividing line. It's also the westernmost state we've covered so far, and will be until we reach Texas four episodes down the road. Missouri borders eight other states, making it, along with neighboring Tennessee, the state that borders the most other states. Iowa sits to the north, Illinois to the east, Kentucky and Tennessee to the southeast, Arkansas to the south, Oklahoma to the southwest, Kansas to the west, and Nebraska to the northwest. Though they're very small borders, I always find it so interesting that only one state lies between Nebraska, with its bluffs, badlands, and sand hills that feel very western, and Tennessee, which includes parts of the Appalachians. It says a lot about Missouri as a meeting point of regions. Its northern border with Iowa stretches between the country's two great rivers, the Mississippi and the Missouri. It begins just south of the Iowa city of Keokuk, 
where the Des Moines River flows into the Mississippi. It follows the Des Moines River for just a few miles upstream to a spot outside the Iowa town of Farmington, where the border leaves the river and moves west, becoming a horizontal border with Iowa sitting to the north. It stretches for 211 miles or 340 kilometers until it reaches the Missouri River, which it follows as it flows southeast, Nebraska lying across its waters. Near the small town of Fortescue, Missouri, the border with Nebraska changes to a border with Kansas, continuing along the river. The Missouri city of St. Joseph and the later the much larger Kansas City both sit on the river along the Kansas border, with suburbs stretching across the Kansas. In Kansas City, at a spot called Caw Point, where the Kansas River flows into the Missouri, the border leaves the Missouri River and cuts south, while the river turns and flows east across the center of the state. Even following a street through Kansas City and its suburbs called State Line Road, the border continues south for 146 miles or 234 kilometers, where just outside the city of Joplin, it becomes a border with Oklahoma. The Missouri-Oklahoma border stretches for just 34 miles or 55 kilometers to a point near the town of Southwest City where it turns east, with Arkansas lying to its south. The Missouri-Arkansas border runs for 248 miles or 399 kilometers to a river called the St. Francis, which it follows downstream for a little ways before cutting 37 miles or 60 kilometers east to the Mississippi forming a region called the Boot Heel. Across the Mississippi sits Tennessee, and further north, Kentucky. At the meeting point of the Mississippi and Ohio rivers, it changes to a border with Illinois, which sits across the river for the rest of Missouri's eastern border. Smaller cities like Cape Girardeau and Hannibal sit across the river from Illinois, as does the largest urban area in the state, St. Louis. The entirety of the state sits within the watershed of the Mississippi River. It's one of only a handful of states, along with Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and Kentucky, as well as the District of Columbia, where all the water that falls in the state flows out to sea through the same river. Unsurprisingly, in much of the state, water flows into its namesake, the Missouri River, which forms part of its eastern border before cutting across the center of the state and meeting the Mississippi. It's fed within the state by tributaries like the Osage and Cheriton. In southern Missouri, rivers form within the Ozarks, flowing either north into the Missouri or south out of the state, where rivers like the White, Black, and St. Francis rivers all eventually make their way into the Mississippi. Northern Missouri feels very Midwestern, with mostly flat land and very low rolling hills. Fertile farmland is punctuated by the occasional small forest or grove of trees. Though not the agricultural powerhouse that neighboring states like Iowa, Nebraska, and Illinois are, Missouri is still a major player in American agriculture, bringing in around $13.8 billion worth of agricultural products annually, the 12th highest of any state. On top of that, it's home to 95,000 farms, more than any other state besides Texas, which has a land area nearly quadruple the size of Missouri. Many of its farms are smaller scale operations. In the north, similar to neighboring Iowa, corn and soybeans dominate, some of the state's largest agricultural exports. The largest urban area in northern Missouri and the sixth largest in the state is St. Joseph, a beautiful historic city in the Missouri River across from Kansas and home to 77,000 people in it and its suburbs. Other larger towns in the region include Kirksville and Hannibal, a town on the Mississippi that was the home of Mark Twain and the inspiration for his famed characters Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. Cutting west to east through the center of the state, the area around the Missouri River is home to both of the state's major cities and a number of smaller ones. Along the state's western edge, where the Missouri turns inward from the border and enters the state fully, sits Kansas City. It's the largest city in the state by population within the city limits, but the second largest urban area. Home to 1.67 million people in it and its suburbs, many of which are across the border in Kansas, it's the 34th largest in the country, smaller than Cincinnati but larger than Columbus. Though neither the largest cross-border urban area in the country or even the state, Kansas City is one of the most famous, largely because it shares its name with its smaller counterpart on the Kansas side. Downtown Kansas City, Missouri is less than a mile from the Kansas border. With the state line so close to the urban center, Kansas City, Kansas is very industrial and urbanized, with a downtown of its own just two miles away and home to a number of high-rises. The Kansas side of the urban area, home to around 785,000 people in suburbs like Kansas City, Kansas, Olathe, and Overland Park, is on its own the most populous urban area in Kansas, surpassing Wichita. A number of suburbs on the Missouri side are old and historic, such as Lee's Summit and Independence. This part of the state feels culturally a bit western, sitting on the edge of the Great Plains, a historic jumping-off point to the trails of settlement, 
that led west through the prairies and mountains. Even today, it's one of the last major cities until you reach the Rockies. Further downstream in the center of the state, sitting on bluffs a few miles from the river, is Columbia, Missouri's fourth largest urban area, with 141,000 people in it and its suburbs. It's a nice, small, fast-growing city, a college town that revolves around the University of Missouri, or Mizzou. The Missouri Valley within the state was historically dominated by slave labor. Further south, agriculture was more difficult in the mountains and hills of the Ozarks, and the Boot Heel region was a swamp that had yet to be cleared. The Missouri Valley was a center of plantation slavery, somewhat disconnected from the other slaveholding regions to the south, and even came to be known as Little Dixie. Today, it's home to a significantly larger black population than the Ozarks further to the south. It also became, along with St. Louis, a destination for German immigrants, and was sometimes referred to as the Missouri Rhineland. Historically, it's been something of a wine-growing region. On the south bank of the Missouri River, south of Columbia, is Missouri's capital city, Jefferson City. Among the smaller capital cities in the country, it's home to around 50,000 people in it and its suburbs, making the state's eighth largest urban area. Though it feels mostly like a small town, the centrally located River City has a few downtown high-rises and is home to a beautiful capital building overlooking the river. On the eastern end of the Missouri Valley, just south of where it meets the Mississippi, sits Missouri's largest urban area, St. Louis. A classic and influential American city, it's the core of an urban area that, home to 2.16 million people, is the most populous in Missouri and the fourth largest in the Midwest, after just Chicago, Detroit, and Minneapolis the latter of which surpasses it as the largest city on the Mississippi, though it's the Missouri River's largest urban area. The suburbs of St. Louis stretch across the Mississippi into southern Illinois, with the city of East St. Louis sitting right across the river from downtown. Together, these Illinois suburbs, including Granite City, Belleville, and Alton, are home to around 519,000 people, surpassing every other Illinois urban area except, of course, Chicago. On the Missouri side, suburbs include St. Charles, a beautiful and historic town on the Missouri River that has since grown into a suburb of the city, and suburbs in neighboring St. Louis County like Clayton, a small suburb that's developed a large downtown. South, and in some areas just north of the Missouri Valley, the landscape changes. This is as far south as the glaciers which killed the Midwest, leaving behind rich deposits of fertile soil and a flattened landscape reached. To the southwest, the Osage Plain, a prairie that's considered part of the Great Plains, stretches in from Kansas. At the southern end, near where the borders of Kansas and Oklahoma meet, is Joplin, Missouri's fifth largest urban area, home to around 86,000 people in the city and its suburbs. Beyond the Osage Plains and the Missouri River, though, the land rises up into a region of hills, mountains, and plateaus. The Ozarks, which together with the Washita Mountains to the south, make up a region stretching into Arkansas, Oklahoma, and a tiny section of Kansas, are relatively short, an ancient mountain range that has eroded down over hundreds of millions of years. But they're the largest mountain region between the Rockies and Appalachians, taking up more land than 18 different states, a rare area of mountains and highlands in the mostly flat center of the country. The influence of the mountains in Missouri is enormous. The Ozarks take up nearly half of the state and are home to Tomsock Mountain, a point in the part of the plateau known as the St. Francis Mountains that at 1,772 feet or 540 meters is the highest point in the state. The Ozarks are almost a cultural cousin of Appalachia, both settled primarily by British and Irish, particularly Scots-Irish and German settlers, in the case of the Ozarks, many of whom came from Appalachia, well, a rugged landscape made agriculture difficult, preventing the plantation system of nearby parts of the south, but also with most settlers who moved into the region getting by on just small subsistence farms or working in lead mines. As with Appalachia, the region's geography kept it partially isolated from areas even just outside, and it developed distinct culture, folklore, traditions, and music. Cattle grazing is a major part of the region's economy. Missouri overall is home to 1.9 million beef cows, fewer than only Texas and Oklahoma. Today, it's one of the poorest parts of the state. Especially in the eastern part of the region, many counties have over a fifth of their residents living in poverty, and have suffered significant population decline. In the western Ozarks, though, a flatter part of the plateau is one of the fastest growing parts of the state. Missouri's third largest urban area, though significantly smaller than either St. Louis or Kansas City, Springfield is home to 282,000 people in it and its suburbs, similar to Davenport, Iowa or South Bend, Indiana. It's home to the Springfield Underground, a complex of refrigerated storage facilities 
built into abandoned limestone mines, known primarily for being home to 1.4 billion pounds of cheese owned by the U.S. government, who subsidized dairy production during a shortage in the 1970s, leading to a period of overproduction, which caused them to then buy up the excess milk, turn it into cheese for storage, and distribute it to welfare recipients for several decades. Now it's mostly in a cave under Springfield. At the same time, the Ozarks have become a major tourism destination. The city of Branson, near the Arkansas border, is a huge tourist town, home to hundreds of hotels as well as resorts, aquariums, shopping centers, amusement parks, water parks, and a popular theater district. The town of 13,000 gets over 9 million visitors a year, and is home to around 65,000 tourists on any given day. Further north, a reservoir called the Lake of the Ozarks is a major recreation destination as well, lined with resorts, second homes, and houseboats. 5 million people vacation at the lake every year. The southeastern corner of Missouri sees the Ozarks give way to a flat, low-lying agricultural region known as the Boot Heel, as the border makes it appear to dig into Arkansas like the heel of a boot. Shockingly, though Missouri is several states away from the ocean, this region is part of the coastal plain that stretches along the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean, from Long Island all the way to the Yucatan Peninsula. From there to the ocean is the plain's widest point, the furthest inland it stretches, this particular section a long flood plain of the Mississippi River. In the Boot Heel and further south in Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, the river is historically flooded beyond its main channel, leaving behind a system of smaller rivers and bayous that create a huge inland delta. The famous delta region of Mississippi, further to the south, is part of this alluvial plain. Historically a forest-covered swamp in the late 1800s and early 1900s, the trees were chopped down and irrigation canals dug, turning the wetland region into a fertile stretch of farmland where crops like rice and cotton were planted. Sharecroppers, many of whom were black descendants of slaves, moved into the region to work the land for often very little pay. Today it remains the poorest part of the state, and culturally it has a lot in common with nearby deep south regions like the Mississippi Delta. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, what is now Missouri was home to an ancient indigenous civilization who lived from the Gulf Coast to the Great Lakes. They left behind no written history and today are referred to only as the Mississippians, governed in different political units but sharing common cultural practices, traditions, and social structures. In the north of the state lived a subgroup called the Oneota. The Mississippians built large cities centered around massive earthen mounds and pyramids, and controlled trade networks that stretched across much of the continent. The largest Mississippian city, Cahokia, was in its heyday the largest city ever built on the continent north of Mexico, surpassing at the time cities like London and Paris. Most of the city, which was a cosmopolitan cultural center of the Mississippians, thought to be a religious pilgrimage destination for Mississippians from across North America, was located across the Mississippi in what are now the Illinois suburbs of St. Louis, but parts of the city stretched across the river into what is today downtown St. Louis. St. Louis was once home to as many as 40 ancient Mississippian structures and was nicknamed Mound City because of them. Most were destroyed, however, and today only one called Sugarloaf Mound remains in the city, though across the river, much of Cahokia's city center is much more well-preserved. Towards the 16th century, however, Mississippian civilization went into decline. It's unclear exactly why, but the early arrival of diseases from Spanish colonists in the Western Hemisphere is thought to likely have been a contributing factor. Today, their descendants make up many of the region's indigenous peoples. Native people from what is now Missouri and other areas in the central part of the Mississippi Valley migrated north over a thousand years ago, their descendants settling in Minnesota and expanding west into the Great Plains, where they became known as the Dakota and Lakota, collectively the Ocheti Shakoin, or Sioux. Missouri is a complex indigenous history. Not only was it the homeland of a number of different peoples, but a fertile crossroads of mighty rivers in the center of the Mississippi Valley. As war and disease ravaged the tribes of the east with the arrival of European settlers, survivors fled west, entire ethnic groups uprooting, many passing through and many resettling in Missouri. The Caddo lived in the very southwest of the state. A confederation of peoples called the Illiniwek or Illinois, whose descendants today call themselves the Peoria and the Miami, lived along the Mississippi River across the entire length of the state. A series of early migrations of Ho-Chunk people south from the Great Lakes saw the creation of three distinct groups, the Oto, Iowa, and Missouri, who lived in the northwestern and central parts of the state. 
Another early migration brought speakers of a Siouan dialect called Dejiha from the Ohio Valley, perhaps as far east as Pennsylvania. Upon reaching the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi, a group of the tribe's members split off, heading downstream to Arkansas, where they became known as the Quapaw, their homeland stretching in part into southern Missouri. The rest continued upstream, then following the Missouri. In the Ozarks, a group split off and would become known as the Osage, a powerful tribe that would control much of the region. Those that continued upstream would split into three other peoples, the Ka or Kansa, would live in northwestern Missouri and spread across much of their namesake Kansas, and further north the rest would settle in Nebraska as the Ponca and Omaha peoples. As European colonial powers and later the United States expanded westward, groups like the Meskwaki or Fox and Sauk peoples were pushed south into northeastern Missouri from Wisconsin, and the Kickapoo fled west from Indiana. Deadly diseases like smallpox, which first arrived with the Spanish, decimated the continent's indigenous people, killing 90% of them, and many survivors often were killed at the hands of settlers. The infamous and deadly Trail of Tears from the southeast to Oklahoma passed through southern Missouri, and eventually most of the region's surviving native people were pushed further west, mostly to neighboring Indian territory, today Oklahoma, though some migrated even further away, some Kickapoo, for example, settling in Mexico. The first Europeans to reach the region were the French, an expedition by a Jesuit missionary named Jacques Marquette and a French-Canadian explorer named Louis Joliet explored the region in 1673, traveling down the Mississippi. A few years later, in 1682, a French explorer named René Robert Cavalier, Seigneur de la Salle, led a voyage down the river, claiming the river valley for France and naming it La Louisiane, or Louisiana, for King Louis XIV. It was initially governed, though, as part of Canada, the French colony centered on the St. Lawrence River and extending southwest to the Great Lakes. The region along the middle section of the Mississippi was referred to as the Illinois Country for the Illinois Confederation of Native People who lived there. In 1700, they built a mission near where the River de Paris meets the Mississippi, though it was soon abandoned. Most colonial settlement in the Illinois Country was at that time on the other side of the river. Nineteen years later, France established a number of lead and silver mines in a spot in the Ozarks they called Mine Lamont, bringing over enslaved black people to work the mines from their colony of Saint-Domingue, what is today Haiti, the beginning of slavery in Missouri. Two years prior, control of the Illinois country was transferred from the French colony of Canada to the French colony of Louisiana. Most of the colony's settlements were on the Gulf Coast further south, and to distinguish the two, the newly added region became known as Upper Louisiana. Still, most of the French settlers in Upper Louisiana had come from the colony of Canada. They founded the first permanent colonial settlement in the state, St. Genevieve, in 1735 on the banks of the Mississippi River. Most of the settlers in the town had lived across the river in what is today Illinois for generations. By that time, France controlled much of the North American interior in a large and powerful empire. Most of their settlements, though, were either at the mouth of the Mississippi in the nearby Gulf Coast in Lower Louisiana, along the St. Lawrence River in the colony of Canada, or surrounding the Gulf of St. Lawrence and Bay of Fundy in the colony of Acadia. In the mid-1700s, Acadia was home to 15,000 colonists, Canada 44,000, and Louisiana 20,000. But Upper Louisiana was only home to around 2,500 of them. The interior was a large fur trading empire, mostly inhabited by native people in trade alliances with France. These trade partnerships along with a system of well-placed forts on strategic waterways, created an arc between the Mississippi and St. Lawrence, connecting the two French colonies and keeping British settlement hemmed in on the other side of the Appalachians. Most of the settlers in Upper Louisiana were fur traders, many of whom married and raised families with native people from the region. The French and Indian War, which began in 1754 over British expansion into the Ohio Valley and lasted nearly a decade, led France, one of the continent's preeminent powers, to lose nearly their entire North American empire, losing Acadia, Canada, and all of Louisiana east of the Mississippi to Britain. Meanwhile, their ally Spain had joined the war, but in response, Britain captured and laid siege to two of their important colonial port cities, Manila and Havana, returning the cities in exchange for the Spanish colony of Florida. To keep them on their side in negotiations and compensate them for their losses, France secretly sold Louisiana to Spain, but it took a few years for the new rulers to actually have administrative control of the colony. In the meantime, Upper Louisiana remained in practice run by French fur traders. One of these fur traders, Pierre Laclede, had been given control by the French government 
over all trade with the Osage and the Missouri River, a huge monopoly, and was looking for a spot for a trading post. Though the confluence of the Missouri and Mississippi Rivers would be a strong strategic location, the actual site itself was low-lying and swampy, difficult to build on. Instead, Laclede chose a site just a few miles downstream on higher ground, just across the river from the site of the ancient city of Cahokia. His stepson, Auguste Juteau, who was just 14 years old at the time, led a group of French settlers to the site and began construction of a town, which Laclede named Saint-Louis for King Louis XIV of France, a pronunciation that would change over time to St. Louis. It was a French-speaking city founded by French settlers. Though technically still under the jurisdiction of France, the transition to Spanish control was inevitable, and by 1770, all of Louisiana west of the Mississippi was a Spanish colony. The territory was large and difficult to govern, and soon after, Spain divided it into Upper and Lower Louisiana. Though still part of the same colony, the old Illinois country was governed as the District of Illinois, given a local government based in St. Louis. The fur trading city was growing quickly, catching up to St. Genevieve, as a number of French colonists from the Illinois country and other parts of the continent's interior on the other side of the Mississippi, not wanting to be under British rule, moved into the Spanish colony, ruled by a fellow Catholic country and where most existing settlers were already French. Another French fur trading settlement, St. Charles, had grown along the Missouri River not far from St. Louis a few years prior. During the Revolutionary War, Spain allied itself with the United States, hoping to take back Florida, which they successfully did from Britain, and Spain used St. Louis and other nearby fur trading towns to supply American forces that were capturing the old French, now British, forts in the Illinois country. During the war, native forces allied with Britain attacked the young city in what was called the Battle of St. Louis, but Spanish troops fended them off, helping allow American forces to gain control of the Mississippi. The war's end now left Upper Louisiana sitting across the Mississippi from a new country, the United States, in particular in American territory called the Northwest Territory. Slavery was soon banned in the territory, and a number of slaveholders in the region moved west into Spanish Louisiana, where slavery was legal. Tensions remained high between Britain and Spain, though, and with war on the horizon between the two back in Europe, Spain worried about a potential British invasion of Louisiana opening up immigration to American settlers to bolster Upper Louisiana's defense. With offers of free land, Americans flocked to the region, settling in new American towns along the Mississippi, like New Madrid and Cape Girardeau. With the end of the Ohio River, a major water route for westward settlement just across the border, and the Missouri River providing a path even further west, Upper Louisiana became a popular destination. American settlers had been flocking to neighboring Kentucky, hundreds of thousands following the route of famed frontiersman Daniel Boone. But Boone himself eventually moved into Upper Louisiana, settling down outside of St. Charles, where he lived until his death and is potentially buried, though gravediggers might have moved his body to Kentucky. Many settlers kept going from Kentucky, following Boone across the Mississippi. Most of these American settlers were of British or Irish descent including a large Scots-Irish population, descended from Scottish and English colonists in Northern Ireland, or were enslaved black Americans brought by the incoming settlers. Nearly all were English-speaking and Protestant, while the region's existing population was predominantly Catholic and French. After just a decade, American settlers outnumbered the French population, and while the region was a fast-growing population center on the frontier, its residents increasingly had little loyalty to Spain. On top of that, Spain was running low on money, and in 1800 it sold Louisiana back to France. France, though, was losing money itself trying to suppress a slave revolt on the island colony of Saint-Domingue that led eventually to the colony's independence as the new country of Haiti. With troops occupied and money tight, France sold the vast colony of Louisiana just three years later to the United States in the famous Louisiana Purchase, nearly doubling the size of the country, the largest ever expansion of American territory besides the country's initial independence. Though claimed by the United States, most of this new territory was in reality controlled by a number of different native peoples, and was, save for the Mississippi River towns in Upper and Lower Louisiana, largely unknown to the U.S. government. Detailed maps of the region did not exist, and many believe there was even a water route, a northwest passage, connecting the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean, likely through the Missouri. President Thomas Jefferson deployed Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to lead an expedition to explore, map, and study the land, and look for a route to the Pacific. After a celebration in St. Louis marking the transfer of the territory into American control, the Corps of Discovery set sail from the city. 
following the Missouri westward, crossing the Rockies, and reaching the Pacific Ocean at the mouth of the Columbia River in what is now Oregon a year and a half later, returning to St. Louis another year after that. The new territory was split in two, the former Lower Louisiana becoming the Orleans Territory, while the rest of the purchase became the Louisiana Territory. St. Louis, by now a bustling and fast-growing gateway to the west, became its territorial capital. The Osage dominated much of what is now Missouri, but as settlers began moving westward onto their land, they started losing control of their territory. In 1808, they were forced to sign the Treaty of Fort Clark, the first of a number of treaties that, over the next few decades, would open most of their land up to settlement and eventually force them west to Oklahoma. In 1811 and stretching into 1812, the territory was rocked by one of the country's most devastating natural disasters. An earthquake measuring somewhere between 7.2 to 8.2 on the Richter scale struck the New Madrid Fault Zone, the strongest earthquake ever to strike the country anywhere besides the earthquake-prone west coast, and a number of serious aftershocks, some possibly even stronger, continued in the following months. The impact of the quakes were massive. 1,000 miles away in Boston, it caused church bells to ring. And in D.C., President James Madison reported it felt the ground shake. For the settlers, slaves, and Native Americans living in this frontier territory, it was a truly terrifying ordeal. Blasts of liquid sand sprayed into the air. Houses crumbled. Cracks opened in the earth. The Mississippi River, running by the fault, flowed backwards for several hours as the ground beneath it shifted. Parts of the river changed course and new lakes were formed. New Madrid was destroyed, and a nearby Native American town was swallowed by river waters rushing to fill a new lake. Large sections of forest were pushed downward, transforming into sunken swampland. Many fled the once thriving region, and it's thought that as many as 500 people were killed, which would make it the deadliest earthquake to strike the U.S. other than the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. In 1812, the Orleans Territory to the south was admitted as a state but it took the unusual step of doing so under a different name, the name of the territory it used to be a part of, Louisiana. The Louisiana Territory took the name instead of the river that ran through the center of it, which its capital city sat just below the mouth of, Missouri. The Missouri Territory was still a sparsely populated frontier territory, but as it grew, its residents began to push for statehood. In 1819, a southern section of the territory was split off into the new Arkansas Territory, and in the previous few years, discussion had ramped up about admitting the more populated section of the territory, home to St. Louis, as a state. It would not be so easy, and would become wrapped up in one of the most controversial and consequential issues of the time. With the Louisiana Purchase and further westward expansion, it was becoming very clear that in the coming decades the country could be home to dozens of new states. Slaveholding states in the South hoped that if new states could be admitted as slave states, where the brutal practice was legal, they could have a Senate majority who supported keeping slavery legal. Meanwhile, abolitionists in the North hoped that by only allowing new states to enter as free states where slavery was outlawed, they could eventually build a Senate majority who opposed slavery, opening the door to emancipation nationwide. At the same time, neither free nor slave states had a clear majority, making the status of the issue in newly admitted states essential to the fate of slavery going forward. In Missouri, roughly a sixth of the territory's population lived in chains, laboring on slave plantations primarily in the Missouri Valley upstream of St. Louis. Many slaveholders in the state wanted slavery to remain legal in Missouri, as did southern politicians opposing the addition of a new free state, while many northern politicians opposed it. As Congress debated the state constitution that would admit Missouri, Congressman James Talmadge added an amendment banning slavery in the state, and after a long debate, Congress was unable to agree on the state's status, stalling its admission, and for months it remained in limbo. Potential for compromise came when a large section of Massachusetts that was physically disconnected from the rest of the state, called the District of Maine, requested statehood as well. Slavery had been outlawed in Maine for decades, and there was no question that the majority of its residents opposed the institution and its expansion. More than a year after Congress had first started voting on Missouri's admission, a compromise was crafted that passed both houses. Missouri would be admitted as a slave state and Maine as a free state, keeping the balance of power the same. As for any new states in the future, slavery would be permitted in states sitting south of the 36th parallel, Missouri's southern border, and outlawed in states north of the line. For another year, statehood remained delayed as Missouri's constitution banned free black settlers from moving to the state. After another compromise, promising that U.S. citizens would be exempt from this clause, 
Missouri was given the green light. On August 10, 1821, four years after first applying for statehood, the southeastern corner of the Missouri Territory was admitted as the 24th state, Missouri. Though Missouri had finally gained statehood, for the tens of thousands of black Missourians living in bondage, a chance for freedom had been lost, and the can had been kicked down the road on the issue of slavery, a controversy not solved but pushed off, and a human tragedy allowed to continue for four more decades. The Missouri Compromise, as it was known, solidified the country's north-south divisions and allowed the political deadlock around slavery to continue, keeping the Senate roughly evenly split. The stage had been set for civil war. The state's borders initially differed from what they are today. In 1837, Missouri purchased a section of land east of the Missouri River, known as the Platte Purchase, from a number of native tribes, and a border dispute known as the Honey War, with the Iowa Territory over the state's northern border, was resolved in 1849, placing it a little further to the north. For the first time, a U.S. state sat fully west of the Mississippi River. Westward expansion in America had begun, fitting for the starting point of the first American expedition, exploring and documenting much of what would become the American West. Though its territorial government had met in St. Louis, Missouri's state government initially met in St. Charles, but quickly moved the capital to a new site, a small town on the Missouri in roughly the center of the state called Lowman's Landing, which they renamed Jefferson City. The new state had become the destination of a new religious movement founded in upstate New York by a man named Joseph Smith, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Smith and other members of the LDS Church, commonly referred to as Mormons, settled in and around a frontier town near the Missouri River in the west of the state called Independence, turning it into the center of the LDS faith. Many other settlers in the state, though, were suspicious of the Mormons, particularly pro-slavery Southerners who'd moved north into Missouri and opposed Mormon advocacy in favor of abolition. Violent mobs began launching attacks on Mormon communities who fought back. Militia groups of Mormons and anti-Mormon so-called old settlers fought in skirmishes throughout western Missouri in what became known as the Mormon War. The state's governor, Lilburn Boggs, sought to drive the Mormons from Missouri, issuing what became known as the Extermination Order, an executive order that, horrifyingly, said that the Mormons, quote, must be exterminated or driven from the state. Three days later, a mob massacred 18 Mormons in the town of Hans Mill. In the following months, most would flee the state, heading east across the Mississippi to Illinois, where they settled around a town called Nauvoo, before encountering more violence and fleeing further west to what is now Utah, which remains today the center of the church and the core of the world's Mormon population. Trade was a major boon to the early growth of the state. A former fur trading colony, Missouri sat at a strategic point on the American frontier. The Missouri River, a great arm reaching west, acting as a route for travelers and merchants venturing into the western U.S. territories and what was then the remote north of Mexico. Mexico's independence from Spain opened it up for trade with the U.S., and merchants carved out the Santa Fe Trail, connecting the then-Mexican city of Santa Fe to the central Missouri town of Franklin, a vital trade link to the Missouri River and with it the steamship arteries of the United States. One of the westernmost points at which steamships could travel up the Missouri, the western city of Independence, grew to be a vital stop on the Santa Fe Trail, the first of three major western routes that would depart from the city. The state's population was growing rapidly, spurred by steamships. The Ohio River provided an excellent ship route from the heavily populated northeast to the country's interior, and the Missouri could bring settlers even further west, turning St. Louis into a fast-growing and influential port city. With only 66,000 residents on the eve of statehood in 1820, Missouri was one of the least populous states in the country, home to fewer people than tiny Delaware. For the next two decades, though, its population would be more than double that of the previous census, and by 1860, it was the country's eighth most populous state, with over a million residents. Many of the new Missourians were new Americans as well. In 1829, a German lawyer named Gottfried Duden, who had lived for a few years in the state, published a book encouraging Germans to move to Missouri. It became incredibly popular, and entire communities, many fleeing revolution and political upheaval in Germany, uprooted and moved to Missouri, settling in rural communities in the Missouri Valley, some of which continued to speak German for generations. As American settlers began to strike it out west, Oregon and California, where gold rushes and promises of newly available land drew hundreds of thousands, Independence and other western river towns like St. Joseph became major sites of departure on westward trails. Southern routes to California, like the Gila Trail and the Old Spanish Trail, left from Santa Fe, which could only be reached by the Santa Fe Trail, which of course left from Missouri. The famed Oregon Trail and the California Trail, which split off of it further up the route, 
began in independence as well. Settlers could reach the city by steamboat, disembark, and board wagon trains west towards California and Oregon. Not far from Independence, other towns developed for the same purpose, like Westport and Kansas City, which would soon become even more successful as a jumping-off point west and grow to eclipse the older Independence. The famous Pony Express left from St. Joseph as a communication line providing mail between California and the east of the country. Slavery became a flashpoint in the state once more, with the Supreme Court's infamous Dred Scott decision, determining that Dred Scott, an enslaved black Missourian who sued for his freedom after being brought into a free state, could not be free, ruling that black Americans could not even be citizens. Often considered the court's worst ever ruling, it further inflamed tensions that would soon lead to conflict. The outbreak of the Civil War put Missouri in an unusual spot. It was a slave state, but not nearly as dependent on slavery as many other states further to the south. Settlers from the South had moved from the Missouri, yes, but so had many from the North, as well as large numbers of immigrants, giving it a cultural mix that didn't evenly align it with the South either. Besides, the Missouri Compromise had placed a border between free and slave states to Missouri's South, meaning in three directions Missouri sat between free states, and secession would likely not end well. It became one of five states that were known as border states, alongside Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and the new state of West Virginia states where slavery had been legal that remained with the Union. Though a number of Missourians fought for the Confederacy, a large majority fought for the Union Army, and the divided state was the site of bloody guerrilla warfare, as well as important battles like the Battle of Wilson's Creek. After the war, Missouri continued to experience rapid growth. Rails connected St. Louis to Kansas City, a major entrance point to the westward trails, and helped turn it to a major western rail hub. It grew rapidly from a small town to a major city, helped by its role as a center of the meatpacking industry. Cattle from Texas moved north across the Great Plains in huge cattle drives, were put on trains in Kansas rail towns, and butchered and processed in Kansas City, from where beef was sent by rail to the population centers of the east. The strategic location of St. Louis, too, benefited the city immensely as the country expanded west, turning it into a rail hub and an industrial powerhouse. As a wave of immigrants from Europe fled wars and famines to the economically booming United States, St. Louis was a major destination. Large numbers of Irish immigrants moved to the city, as did Germans, encouraged in part by the existing German population in the area. Perhaps the city's most famous immigrants were Eberhard Anheuser, a soap maker who bought a small struggling St. Louis brewery, and his son-in-law Adolphus Busch. German immigrants who turned it into Anheuser-Busch, which would eventually become the largest brewing company in the country, popularizing brands like Budweiser and Michelob. Prohibition would have a particularly damaging impact on the city's economy due to its large brewing industry. A Hungarian immigrant, Joseph Pulitzer, namesake of the Pulitzer Prize, began his journalism career in St. Louis with the German language Vestische Post and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. By 1870, St. Louis was home to 310,000 people. Its population had quadrupled in just 20 years, and it had skyrocketed to become the fourth largest city in America, surpassed by only the East Coast giants of New York City, Philadelphia, and then the separate city of Brooklyn. It would remain one of the country's 10 largest cities all the way until 1960. By 1870, the state too had become the country's fifth most populous, behind just New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Illinois, a spot it would hold for the next three decades. Missouri was a state on the rise, and St. Louis was very much a city of global importance. In 1904, it hosted both the World's Fair and the Olympic Games, the first time the Olympics came to the U.S. Author Mark Twain from Hannibal became one of the country's most influential authors. In the 1920s, it was struck by two enormous natural disasters. In 1925, the Tri-State Tornado, the deadliest tornado in American history, touched down in Missouri before crossing the Illinois and Indiana. And two years later, an enormous flood struck the Mississippi, though most of its destruction was further downstream. The state has been struck by a number of disastrous tornadoes. One in 1896 killed as many as 400 people in the St. Louis area, and a tornado in 2011 destroyed much of the city of Joplin, killing 186 people. Though Missouri had remained with the Union, the Missouri Compromise was not the end of its troubled racial history. The state enacted Jim Crow laws enforcing racial segregation and was the site of a large number of lynchings. At the crossroads of the South and the Midwest, Missouri, though arguably a part of the Jim Crow South, was actually a destination for black Southerners fleeing North in the Great Migration. Segregation and racial discrimination, though a major problem in the state, were not as extreme as in the rural Deep South, where many black Southerners worked for little to no pay as sharecroppers and exploited a form of agriculture that kept the region languishing in poverty. 
The practice spread into Missouri in the early 1900s as the swamps and forests of the boot heel were cleared and turned into cotton farms. St. Louis and Kansas City were very much industrial Midwestern cities, and their status as major rail hubs made them prime destinations for black Southerners leaving north for manufacturing jobs that opened up during the World Wars. The state already had a large black population, but it grew significantly during the Great Migration, many leaving for St. Louis and Kansas City from nearby Mississippi. In St. Louis, like in many Midwestern cities, redlining and racial housing covenants divided the city's black and white populations geographically, creating patterns of housing segregation that have been hard to break. Even decades later, St. Louis is considered to be among the most de facto segregated cities in America, divided between north and south, roughly along Del Mar Boulevard. In 2014, the shooting of Michael Brown by police in the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson sparked weeks of unrest with protests and riots gaining national attention. The eventual end of Jim Crow, coupled with the growth of American suburbs as the automobile took off, sparked a phenomenon in many cities known as white flight, in which wealthy and middle-class white Americans left the city for new suburban developments. It was a particular problem in St. Louis. The St. Louis city population essentially went into freefall. Today, it's roughly a quarter of the size it was in 1950, while at the same time, the greater urban area population has increased steadily, and the population of suburban St. Louis County doubled. The loss of so many residents has hollowed out the city's tax base, and the so-called Great Divorce, the splitting of the city from St. Louis County in 1876, is often blamed for making the resulting economic and political challenges worse, preventing St. Louis from expanding its city limits even as its urban area grew, a strategy that Kansas City used to help stem decline. A city with a strong manufacturing history, St. Louis is sometimes considered to be the western edge of the Rust Belt, and the area experienced significant manufacturing job loss alongside the rest of the region throughout the second half of the 20th century. Like many Rust Belt cities, it's led to a period of steady population loss. In the meantime, the Kansas City area has grown significantly to the point where the two urban areas are nearing one another in population. As the state's population plateaued, Sun Belt states grew, and Missouri fell in the last century from the 5th to the 18th most populous state in the U.S. Just below the confluence of the country's two longest rivers, St. Louis is the largest urban area in the state, though the population within the city limits itself is no longer the state's largest. With 2.16 million people in it and its suburbs, a number of which are across the Mississippi and Illinois, it's the 22nd largest urban area in the United States and one of the largest in the Midwest. It's a quintessentially American city, old and historic, long one of the largest in the country. The Gateway Arch, which rises over downtown beside the Mississippi, is one of the most iconic landmarks in the United States and a symbol of the city. If considered a building, it's the tallest in the state, rising 632 feet or 192 meters, and incredibly, it's the tallest monument on the entire planet. Designed by architect R.O. Saarinen, it symbolizes the role of the city and the state as the gateway to the west and a tram inside can take you to an observation deck on the top. It sits in a nice riverfront city park, which in 2018 was actually designated a national park. It's one of the newest national parks in the country, by far the smallest, and the only one which really was designated for its historical, not natural, significance. Unfortunately, much of the city's historic riverfront neighborhoods were raised for the construction of the arch, although one section, Laclede's Landing, still stands. The city has a great baseball culture. Bush Stadium right downtown is a beautiful ballpark with great views of the city. It remains a center of the global brewing industry. Anheuser-Busch has a huge brewery in the city. A string of parks and plazas run downtown, ending at the Arch, and include the city's beautiful old courthouse. Forest Park is a beautiful city park, and the historic Eads Bridge connects downtown to East St. Louis, Illinois. It's been influenced by its French founders, symbolized in its really nice city flag, later German immigrants, black southerners from the Great Migration, and more recently Bosnian immigrants. In the 90s, the city took in tens of thousands of Bosnians fleeing the Bosnian War, and today it's home to the largest Bosnian population outside Bosnia. One of America's great rail cities, it's the third busiest freight rail hub in the country and is home to a beautiful Union Station, on top of being a busy river port city. Unfortunately, the city has gained a reputation as having a pretty serious crime problem. Stats like the third highest crime rate and highest murder rate in the country are certainly alarming. While I'm not saying to throw caution to the wind, you should be careful and keep your wits about you anywhere you visit, it's worth remembering that these are not exactly apples to apples comparisons. Crime tends to be concentrated in the densely populated urban hearts of the city. 
Because of the Great Divorce, this urban core makes up essentially the entirety of its city limits. If we look instead at crime rates by metro area, St. Louis is pretty much the middle of the pack, lower than Kansas City, although the murder rate is still on the higher side. Though like all cities, it has its share of issues, St. Louis is a great and historic American city with a lot to offer. On the other side of the state, Missouri's second largest urban area and largest city by population in the city limits, Kansas City is a westward-facing metropolis that has played an essential role in American history and is one of the fastest growing parts of the state. Home to 1.67 million people in the city and its suburbs, it's the second largest urban area in the state and the 34th largest in the country. While a number of other urban areas cross state borders, perhaps no other cross state urban area is as closely connected as Kansas City. It shares its name with one of the largest cities on the Kansas side, and downtown Kansas City, Kansas is only about a seven minute drive from downtown Kansas City, Missouri. Though the main city is in Missouri, residents of both states really view themselves as one city to an extent that's difficult to find elsewhere in the country. Its strategic location at the point the Missouri and Kansas rivers meet and the Missouri River turns north made the area the starting point for a number of routes west, the center of shipping and an essential rail hub. St. Louis is the country's third busiest freight rail center, Kansas City is the second. Its Union Station is beautiful and is one of the most iconic train stations in the country. Though sharing its name with a neighboring state can be confusing, Kansas City was founded and named four years before the state of Kansas was, both named for the Kansas River, although the river reaches its end at Caw Point, just across the state line from Missouri. Testament to its decades of growth, it's actually home to slightly more skyscrapers than its larger counterpart, and if you don't count the Gateway Arch, the city's one Kansas City place is the tallest building in the state. Neighborhoods like Westport and suburbs like Independence are historic cities in their own right. And downtown KC itself is home to a great combination of parks with beautiful sculptures, public art, and monuments like the National World War I Museum and Memorial, historic red brick buildings, modern steel and glass skyscrapers, and spectacular art deco buildings like the Kansas City Power and Light Building. It's one of the country's best barbecue cities, a rare example outside the South known for a thick, sweet barbecue sauce and for popularizing burnt ends. In terms of race, 78% of Missourians are white, 11% are black, 4% Latino, 3% multiracial, and 2% Asian American. Most Missourians trace their ancestry back to Germany, Ireland, England, or enslaved people from Africa. In terms of religion, 77% of Missourians are a Christian, 3% practice other faiths, and the remaining 20% are unaffiliated. Most are Protestant, predominantly evangelical, although the state is home to a large Catholic population as well. Of course, when it comes to food, the state is known for Kansas City-style barbecue, but St. Louis holds its own in the barbecue scene as well, with St. Louis-style spare ribs. Other classic Missouri dishes include gooey butter cake, toasted ravioli, and St. Louis-style pizza, a thin crust pizza with local staple Prevel cheese. Most of the state speaks in the so-called Midland dialect, which is common in the Midwest, though further south you'll hear southern accents, and the Ozarks have their own distinct dialect, heavily influenced by Scots-Irish settlers from Appalachia. It's had a large influence on music. St. Louis is famed for its influence on blues. Both St. Louis and Kansas City have major jazz scenes, and country, bluegrass, ragtime, and folk music has been big in rural Missouri. The Ozarks in particular have had a strong musical history with a long tradition of use of the banjo and fiddle. Missouri is home to five major league sports teams. The NFL's Kansas City Chiefs, who've played in four of the last five Super Bowls and won three of them, play in Kansas City's Arrowhead Stadium, and the MLB's Kansas City Royals play right next door at the Kauffman Stadium. St. Louis is home to three teams, all of which play downtown. The MLB's St. Louis Cardinals at Bush Stadium, the NHL's St. Louis Blues at Enterprise Center, and the MLS's St. Louis City SC at City Park. A Kansas City MLS team, Sporting Kansas City, plays across the state line in Kansas, but represents both cities and has a large fan base in Missouri as well. The state's largest newspapers are the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the Kansas City Star. Its busiest airports are the St. Louis Lambert International Airport and the Kansas City International Airport. Major universities include the University of Missouri or Mizzou in Columbia, Missouri State in Springfield, and Washington University in St. Louis. Major companies include the health insurance corporation Centene, Emerson Electric, Reinsurance Group of America, and O'Reilly Automotive. Panera Bread, founded in St. Louis, still goes by its original name, the St. Louis Bread Company, in the area. Anheuser-Busch has since been bought out and is now headquartered in Belgium, but still maintains major operations in St. Louis. A number of famous and influential people were born in or lived in Missouri, including Mark Twain, George Washington Carver, T.S. Eliot, 
Josephine Baker, Kevin Klein, Yogi Berra, Joseph Pulitzer, J.C. Penney, Nelly, Tennessee Williams, Don Cheadle, Jason Tatum, Eminem, who was born in St. Joseph but lived most of his life in Detroit, Ed Asner, Chuck Berry, Jenna Fisher, Tech Nine, Brad Pitt, Akon, Phyllis Schlafly, Walt Disney, Walter Cronkite, Ginger Rogers, Rush Limbaugh, John J. Pershing, Dick Van Dyke, and Jesse James, to name a few. Ulysses S. Grant lived for several years at Whitehaven, his wife's family's plantation, which was now suburban St. Louis, but only one president was really from the state. Harry Truman was born in Lamar, a small town in southwest Missouri, grew up in Independence, where his presidential library is today, and died in Kansas City. He began his political career as a judge in Jackson County, home to Kansas City, before representing Missouri for 10 years in the Senate. In the 1944 election, Truman was picked to be FDR's third vice president as he ran for a fourth term and won, but had been the vice president for less than three months when Roosevelt died and he became president. He would finish Roosevelt's term and win election to a full term in his own right in 1948. In 1946, he invited Winston Churchill to the state, where, speaking at Westminster College in the small town of Fulton, Churchill delivered his famous speech warning of a developing Cold War describing an iron curtain descending across Europe. Politically, Missouri is a pretty reliably red state, with a Cook PVI of R plus 10, meaning that in a given presidential election, the Republican nominee tends to outperform their national average by about 10% in Missouri. The last Democrat to win there was Bill Clinton in 1996, though Barack Obama came within a tenth of a percent from victory in 2008. Of Missouri's eight representatives in the House of Representatives, six are Republicans and two are Democrats. Both the state senators, Josh Hawley and Eric Schmidt, are Republicans, as is Governor Mike Parson. That is it for Missouri. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who's already joined my Patreon. Through it, you can access different things such as quarterly channel newsletters, thumbnail previews, early access to maps I create, an exclusive Discord Q&A with me, and shout out to my videos, such as these. I'm currently on a filming tour for the U.S. Explained, traveling to and filming in the rest of the states and territories that haven't covered yet, so stay posted. I'll be releasing more info about it as I go. Also, please subscribe to my brother's channel, Quinn the Cameraman. He made the great intro at the beginning of this video that I'll use in all the U.S. Explained videos, so go show him some support. And check out the podcast we co-host, Riffing and Ranting. We bring on some cool guests, some of whom you're probably familiar with. I tried to be pretty thorough with this video, but I know there are definitely things I missed as there was a lot to talk about. I want to give a big thank you to everyone from Missouri who helped give me information for this video, leaving detailed and informative comments on YouTube as well as Discord. I truly would not have been able to make this video without all your help. My next video in the series will be on Arkansas, a state I've spent a little bit of time in. After Arkansas, all the videos in the series will be filmed on site, which I'm super excited for. If you're from Arkansas, please respond to my community post or my comment here, or leave something in the Discord server to let me know what you'd like to see included about your home state. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you learned something new. Subscribe for more content like this. I cover the countries, cities, people, and places of the world and beyond. These videos will leave you saying, that is interesting.